Hi, welcome to the Red Booth Show. On tonight's episode, I have the director of Sharknado. His name is Anthony C. Ferrante, and he's pretty awesome. So come and join us. So, hello, Anthony. Hello, how you doing? I'm good, because you're here today. <laughs> <laughs> I've been wanting to have you on my show for so long. It's been about a year, right? Yeah, probably yeah. since I started like, hey, uh, hey, come on my show. But I'm so happy because your show, your movie, I'm sorry, has become just like a total phenomena, Sharknado. It's amazing. And it's, uh, it's been a very weird two and a half years. <laughs> This little tiny movie we did that that uh, no one ever anticipated it doing anything, and it just kind of kind of blew up into something. Yeah. And it was all kind of grassroots, and then it, you know it was, it, people found it, and then it became became what it is. I remember when it first came out, um, it was like people were just talking about it. Did you see Sharknado? Like just okay. For obviously the whole concept of it is hilarious in the first place because it's about. A tor tornadoes filled with sharks. Well, water spout tornadoes filled with sharks, right? Yes. Yeah. But well, with that, and the concept is kind of basically morphed into the idea that um, it's not sharks, it's not tornadoes. It's the villain is a sharknado. So the rules are whatever we make it to be. Like, how did you even think of the shark and tornado concept in the first place? It's 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 a long. It's been a long process. But I mean, I was writing a lot of scripts for sci-fi and. Uh, That's my, right for sci-fi channel, right? For sci-fi channel. That's and, right. Um, uh, my occasional writing partner Jacob Hare and I were trying to come up with some pitches, and uh, one of the pitches was uh, Sharknado, and it didn't go. They it, they didn't bite at it at first. And then I was writing a Leprechaun script for them, and I, the, the title just tickled us, so I just kind of made a reference to it in the Leprechaun script about you know them trying to cover up the Leprechaun thing, and they, they don't want to have what happened in the town over. Remember Sharknado? They never lived that down, something like that. And then they decided, we got to make this, and then suddenly uh, they're, they're making it, and I'm, I'm doing the movie. I, I was a horror guy. I was doing horror films, so I was the least likely person to actually direct a movie called Sharknado. <laughs> um, and, but they took a chance on giving, you know, letting, me, letting me do it, and uh, you know, because it's it was it was a chance to actually do some stuff that I never got to do before, which is action and comedy, um, and you know visual effects, uh, you know palooza. <laughs> That's true. It's full of it, and I mean you started out like I know you did like Headless Horseman and a few other movies like that before Sharknado. Yeah, those were all the horror type. Yeah, movies. but my first movie was Boo, and I did Headless Horseman. Boo is about a ghost, right? It's a ghost story. Yeah. Yeah. That's my that's my first movie. Cool. And then Hansel and Gretel, which I did with Asylum, who also did the Sharknado. And then I wrote a bunch of horror movies that got made by sci-fi. Cool. That's amazing. So you and your friend came up with the idea of the Sharknado. Yeah. And then you got the green light and you went, and did you did you decide on casting and everything? No, I mean, I was brought in uh, later into the process. Um, they, uh, Thunder Eleven wrote the, uh, the screenplay for it, who has worked with Asylum before. And uh, at the time, the... Uh, when they were trying to cast it, they were calling it Sharknado, but no one wanted to be in a movie called Sharknado. And so then they changed it to Dark Skies, and then people going, okay, I'll read the script. <laughs> but I mean, no one wanted, I mean, it's it, it's weird. No one wanted to be in the movie. They went through a laundry list of so many different actors. I mean, and across the board, not just like your action heroes. I mean, they were talking to like, you know, comedians and all, like Steve Gutenberg was, was at one point. And then I, I had a long conversation with Crispin Glover. I mean, can you imagine Kristen Glover as, as Finn Shepard? It would no. be a different type of movie, but it would have been interesting. But then when they said, um, oh, Ian Ziering's doing it, it's like, why didn't we go to him from the beginning? Because it was like, it was just the obvious choice. He fits so perfectly. Yeah, it, it was like, the moment he, they said his name, it was like, okay, that's that's the guy. I yeah. mean, that was it. But, uh, you know, the, it's how these things happen. You know, we got John Hurd and Tara Reid. I mean, it was a really great cast for a movie like this. Yeah. And then uh, day three, when they suddenly started finding out it might be called Sharknado, it was like, you know, Frankenstein's monster with the pitchforks and, and flames. Like, we're, uh, you know, why We're are they calling it? No, no, it wasn't that. It's like, we got to have them change the name of this. We can't have it called Sharknado. You know, but let's call it. But that's why it's so cool. Well, no, I know. And I, I said, look, just you guys have to trust me. If, if they do call it Sharknado, which, you know, I mean, they change a lot of these titles all the time. So mm -hmm. I was like, if they call it Sharknado, trust me, it'll be a good thing. And they trusted me, and it was a good thing for everybody. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, so, yeah, it was. It was a very. It was very interesting. But I mean, obviously, you know, the script. There's, <laughs> there's sharks and tornadoes. So I mean, it's, it's hilarious. It's kind of an obvious title that's going to be. So there's, there was actually this really funny things that like not just the sharks in the tornadoes, but there was like you had something with the Hollywood sign. Well, but if you're going to destroy Los Angeles, you got to destroy Los Angeles. I yeah. Mean, period. You got to you got to find a way to, to do it. And um, actually, actually, when I when when the script 
when I got the script, it didn't have the Hollywood sign in there. Oh, okay. And I was like, well, we, we got to destroy it somehow. And then the idea was, like, let's let's like have it like destroy somebody and smash <laughs> it was somebody. So and, hilarious. And that was actually Robbie, my uh, buddy of mine, and we do some of the songs for the film. Oh, it was the guy that was the teacher and the yeah, bus, the bus yeah. driver. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was like it's 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 interesting. There's there's certain destruction in these movies, and sometimes the destruction isn't the tornado that kills them. So I think that that's what I kind of like about it's it. Funny. I thought it was hilarious. I thought hot. My mom always said Hollywood uh, would kill me, and then and then splat. <laughs> so it, it it was fun. I mean, the, yeah. Los Angeles is hard too because I mean there are some iconic uh, places, but um, you know it's not as as rich as something like New York where you have right. you know Statue of Liberty, Empire State Building, Times Square. I mean there's there's a lot more stuff. Yeah. You know if you're from LA, you know certain things, but if you're not from LA, you don't. You know you really yeah. know that you really know Hollywood Boulevard and probably the Hollywood sign yeah so yeah it's true but I love I love that we got to do the Santa Monica Pier with the, the Ferris wheel that was amazing the whole Ferris wheel coming in like crashing into the hotel and yeah that was so that funny. was another thing too it wasn't they, they they had it on the poster that it wasn't a script I went to the producer I'm going you have this on the poster we have to put this into the movie and it's like <laughs> okay figure it out <laughs> it's like all right <laughs> Because I, I actually get I get hung up. I, I guess it's because my background in journalism sometimes like when the posters don't emulate what's in the movie. <laughs> yeah, no, you're and, right. It and, should. And there's there's in the third movie they did the poster and they a- amplified the this the space element that might be in or may not be in the movie. And I'm like, oh, we gotta embrace this a little bit more then. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I loved watching that because obviously you know I live in LA and going down to Santa Monica Pier and then seeing like. That this is all set in the Santa Monica Pier. Yeah, it's really funny. Yeah, that, there, there's some great effects in there. Uh, I mean, some of that rolling Ferris wheel, I think, is just as good as anything in a big studio movie. Yeah, it was. It was really good. And I thought it was funny that you made jokes too about living in Beverly Hills. <laughs> uh, a lot of those were thunder. Those were thunder jokes. I, I, I think though everybody you know understands. I hate the four or five. I mean, that, that, <laughs> I mean, I think everybody's been. Doesn't the everyone? Five. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and that was also too. It's it's always trying to figure out the trajectory and trying to make sure the logic works so people don't go, hey, you can't be from there. But you know, I mean, look, twenty four, uh, the Keeper Sutherland show was always all around oh, Los yeah. Angeles, and none of it made sense. If you're from LA, it's like, wait yeah. a minute, how can he be here and then be in Valencia? Yeah, wait a minute, he just destroyed Valencia. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Santa totally Clarita. True. So yeah, it, it's uh, you, you got to you got to take a grain of salt. We we tried to again adhere to that in, in the in two and three as well, especially with New York. But you know, you gotta you gotta take a leap of faith a little bit. That's right. You're already on Sharknado three right now. Oh yeah. That's amazing. And you guys are editing. Yes, we're in the editing bay right now, and it's uh, it's you know it's these these movies get made very quickly. Uh, and, and by the time we're done uh, with three and it's airing, it has been two and a half years, and we have made a trilogy of of, of shark movies. That's so funny. Well, you you've made like already done like the first one and the second one only in the last like two and a half years or something. No, all three of them. I mean, by the time I mean, all said and done, we it'll be two and a half years with for all three movies because we started January. Of 2013, and then the summer it aired, and then yeah. we shot the last one in January, and it aired in the summer. And now we shot this one in January, and it's, it's going to air in a couple months. I remember when you were shooting Sharknado 2, and it got featured on like TMZ, and they were all like in New York with the bus and all this stuff because, of course, the first one came out and it was like a total hit phenomenon and hilariousness. And then you had all these other casts that wanted to be in Sharknado 2. Yeah. So then your Sharknado 2 cast became like totally amazing. Yeah, well, you know, it was it, it's it's strange too, is I would have never figured like from the first movie because we were talking about crazy things like in the first movie. Well, what if what if we shot like on the tram at, at at Universal Studios and we did this and we and and it's like no, that can never happen and all that stuff. And then when we were talking about two, one of the things we wanted to do was do something at City Field. We wanted a baseball thing. And um, literally, everybody was saying, it, it, the, Major League Baseball will never let you do this, and it's never going to happen. Well, we got to try because there was a lot of uh, support from the sports community, and we really wanted to do something with uh, Major League Baseball. And I mean, it was like down to the wire. And finally, Met Stadium, when we were in New York, I said, We'll do it, let's do it. And we shot it, Met Stadium. That's amazing. And, and, and that would have never happened on the first movie. And then in the third film, um, Universal Studios Orlando. Uh, because it's part of the NBC sci-fi family, they're like, you know, why, why don't you guys shoot here? And so kind of full circle, because in the first month, they want we shoot Universal Hollywood. Um, and so we actually shot at Universal Orlando as Universal Orlando. And they let us 
do some destruction at the park, which is kind of unheard of wow. with these movies. I mean, normally they just want it to all be like, hey, here's a love story at Universal Orlando, and here's like, hey, can we have the roller coaster slam into this and do this and that? And it's just, as long as the sharks are doing it, then, then it's no problem. That's awesome. And, and so that, that was actually really fun. They gave us the run of the park. It was, wow. a, it was an amazing experience being able to do things that, um, you know, I don't think a lot of productions have ever been able to do there. Because it's not like, I mean, there's lots of sci-fi movies, but this yeah. was like, it's almost like a cult classic already. Well, yeah, you know, I think, yeah, we, no one kind of expected it to be what it was going to be. Um, I, I remember watching the um, almost finished version of it because it, the, we have like a, like over three or four hundred visual effects per movie. I mean, I think maybe more than that. And so you don't really see the movie probably until about two or three weeks before it, it's it's about to be delivered because you know all the stuff's getting in and you're starting to see the flow. So we watched the movie probably about a month before it was going to air and, and and it was only a couple a couple of a friend of mine and I think one of the other editors and we were watching it going this is a weird movie <laughs> and, and and it's it and I don't know if anybody's going to get it because it's so bizarre because take away the phenomena that's happened it, it's yeah. it's a weird film yeah and I, I said it's it, it maybe in a few years it could potentially be a cult movie or we probably made the greatest stoner movie ever made <laughs> and so that all happened like within you know, the moment it aired, it was an instant stoner movie, and it was an instant cult classic. And again, you can't ever anticipate it. And again, we weren't trying to set out to do it. It just it happened. And I think that's the special thing about the first movie is that yeah. we didn't buy or market this movie as if we were a big studio movie. It was it was earned by the the public saying we're going to own this. Yeah. They were like, you no, know, there was like parties, like Sharknado party watching. No, parties. And, and we didn't say do this. They just, yeah. they just did it. And because... then that's why it blew up. But the, it's so hard with these small movies, especially on, on, on like something like sci-fi. Cause I've written a bunch of them and, I, and a couple of them have aired and to really capture everybody. Like they did a really good job with Sharktopus, but it's still, it's still didn't blow up that's like right. Sharknado. That's right. That's like the shark and yeah, the octopus that, yeah. Yeah, together. But, but Sharknado awesome. for some strange reason just became this huge, big thing thing and 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 when it happened everybody was just caught off guard it's like really it was like did this happen it just was kind of like an out-of-body experience because <laughs> you know you have big movies that came out that summer like lone ranger and you know and everybody was talking about sharknado a tv movie yeah and they had like 200 million dollars to market lone Whoops. ranger and we had zero <laughs> practically <laughs> So it was, it was it was it was very strange to see this thing just continue to go and um, yeah. but but like you know it's 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 very very cool because I actually got to make a trilogy. That's amazing. I, and you know how often can someone say they've directed a trilogy of movies? Yeah, it's so funny. Well, like when you were shooting Sharknado the first time before you knew it was going to be this huge hit. Were you like going for the like sort of ridiculous stuff like like when the shark comes flying in through from the ocean into the bar? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. I, the the thing was is the the goal was was to ground everything and the characters. So everything is taken seriously as much as possible with the characters, unless it's someone that was comic relief, like John Hurd. Right. John Hurd gets a little more leeway, and Judah Friedlander in the second one gets a little more leeway. But if you if if everybody's playing it like camp and over the top, then it falls apart. Mm. But if everybody is earnest and serious and treating it like it's a, you know an, yeah. a regular earthquake or it's you know an alien invasion or whatever it is, yeah. then then that sincerity kind of translates, and then you can go even further with your villain, which is the Sharknado. You can yeah. do crazy stuff, and that makes and I, it even more funny. Yeah, so I, I think that was how the balance kind of worked because um, Robbie, Robbie, who saw the rough cut. Uh, who played the bus driver? He he told me it's a movie that doesn't know it can't do that, and I think that's the the, the, the fun part because <laughs> it, it it feels like we're trying to do a two hundred million dollar movies and sometimes we're coming up incredibly short. But there's this earnestness because we're going oh, we don't care we're just we're going to do it. Yeah. I mean because the the structure and the amount of stuff that we crammed into that first movie is it, there, there's enough stuff in there for three of these movies, mm -hmm. and we just said we're just going to go and make the best, biggest, craziest film. And Asylum, which was really great about it, they just go for it, try it. Because there's, there, I've worked with the, some of the companies that make these movies and they, they have a very finite budget and they're, they're, they don't necessarily want to go crazy with it. They yeah. want to be very compartmentalized. Okay, we can do something here, do something here. And, and that's a smart way of doing it. But this one, we were just unhinged. We just like, oh, let's do this. Hey, let's throw this out here. Let's do this. And that's, I think, added to the charm of it because it, it, it's just like you're watching it going, this thing doesn't stop. Yeah. I mean, this movie is just jam-packed with stuff. I know. When you had, like, the chainsaw near the end, like, I was like, he's, <laughs> well, he's literally, like, buzzing in half, like, 
giant sharks flying at him like with a huge chainsaw that was awesome I, the, the him going into the shark too uh, um, yeah. that was another one I didn't know we were going to get past because in, in the original script the, the, the he was on the ground <laughs> right. and then the shark chomped at him and he went into the shark and I'm like no it has to be like a, you know, a, you know martial, it has to be like a martial arts movie it's like here comes a shark and he jumps up in the air and then and he gets like swallowed he's spinning with the uh, chainsaw and, and we got away with it I was waiting for them to go you're not going to have this in this movie There's it was that. awesome and that became Came the thing that everybody kept airing uh, over and over, like when the promotion oh, of, yeah. the, of the first movie, um, and that was actually something Ian came in as a favor in post to do for me. He got on green screen because we never got the shot where he was going into it. Yeah, so he came in as a favor, did the green screen shot, that was cool. and then Karma came back, and that was the shot that everybody was talking about. Amazing! So it's so funny. It's so oh well. Congratulations for your success, and uh, oh, you know thank you. it's so exciting, and I can't wait to see Sharknado three. And Sharknado three, July twenty second uh, on Sci Fi. On Sci Fi, okay, yeah. good. Yeah. And don't didn't you have some theatrical releases too? That we, we yeah we've uh, there, there's been a couple riff tracks, but usually about a couple weeks after it airs, uh, they do a, a, a fan, fan, uh, Fathom Events screening. That's really awesome. And then, um, and then the other thing too is, uh, you know, Robbie and I have actually done a lot of the songs for the movies, and you can find that on on iTunes under the band name Quint. That's right. Yeah. No, you're like just this amazingly talented director, and you also are a musician, and you create these songs. And his songs have been in all the Sharknado movies since the very first one. We wrote the theme song. That's the, right. The Ballad of Sharknado. That's right. Where they're like shark, and it's like this whole. <laughs> it totally reminds me of like a, you know, like you were saying, like an old like '80s sort of rock. Well, well, sound well, and, can, the whole thing it came from was like. Um, one of my favorite uh, theme songs to a movie was Pet Cemetery by the Ramones. It's like, I don't want to be buried in Pet Cemetery. I don't want to live my life again. You sound, and, it and, sounds and, similar. And so, so it's like, okay, well, yeah. if, if the Ramones are around, what kind of, of song would they write for Sharknado? And that's kind of where it started. It's like, well, we need to write this sort of kind of power punk kind of song. And, that, and it was actually really easy. And I, it was really bizarre how fast that song came. It was like, go, 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 run away from the Sharknado. It's your greatest <laughs> fo fo fo. Don't want to get eaten by a Sharknado. It was, it was really cool. <laughs> And, and Robbie uh, is just an incredible musician, and so you know he he produces the stuff, and he just and it just makes it sound so good. And that was again, everyone's going, oh, don't do that, that's too cheesy, don't do it with the song. And it's like oh, the song was great. We got to do the song. And the song is great. And now we've got like this song, and it was nice. And that's just one song. You've done a couple songs now for the show, for the movie, right? We, um, one and two, I think total. We probably have about. Uh, five to twelve songs. Oh, no, no, nine to twelve songs in there. Wow. Um, I just I can't. I know we reused a couple things on the second movie. Cool. Um, and then we're gonna probably do a couple more for this one. And what's the name of your band again? It's called Quint. Okay. Because of of the character Robert Shaw character from Jaws. Okay. But when Robbie and I have done music on my other movies, it, it, the joke was we would rename the band each time because the idea is the band broke up. So like the first movie was the Black and Blues Reviews. The second movie was Toothless Jimmy and the Applejack Kids. <laughs> and the third one it was the Gingerbread Men. And then Quint happened, and it's like I guess we're Quint now. <laughs> because because it's because, now because it's, people know. Yeah. Because again, we never thought this. It was always just like a side thing. It was just let's have fun, let's put this stuff out there and see what happens, and it and it kind of took off a little bit. So we'll, we're just keeping the name Quint, and that's the that's the sort of gag. So it's very cool. Yeah, that's a good problem to have. Uh, we're becoming too famous with this band name, so I guess we can't change our name now. That's not bad. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, look, you don't want people, and if we're actually putting some of the other stuff out too that we did under the Quint name now too. Cool. But I mean, it's really amazing that you're able to write all these songs and make movies and. I know you even came from a background of doing special effects, so yeah. you're like super talented. It's so yeah. awesome. And you gotta keep it. You gotta do. You gotta know how to do different things in this business. But That's the true. the music's the fun thing. I mean, you know, it's like whenever you get a chance, you know, you get to do the fun little bits and pieces of stuff. So it's like if you can do it, you do it. But the problem, the reason why we did the music wasn't because like, oh, we're gonna do music. It's that when you're doing low budget movies, you can't afford to license. The really, soundtrack. really, really great songs. Yeah, you know, you you probably are lucky if you get twenty five, fifty bucks a song to do it, and you know, a, a really good song anything. is like five hundred grand. Yeah, and so, um, and the stuff that you can license, you know, I've licensed from friends that have great music, but there's specific things like on Headless Horseman, we wanted bluegrass and and gospel and stuff, and th some of that stuff is really expensive. So we you know, we'll just do it ourselves, and that's that's it was kind of out of necessity, not because we wanted to, you know shove a song in there amazing well it's um, all worked out really well yeah and the, the other thing that's going to come out uh july 22nd i'm writing uh the 
Archie versus Sharknado comic book. Oh, that's right. I heard about that. Yeah, so uh, they're actually going to put out the book, yeah, Sharknado yeah. with Archie. It's Archie versus Sharknado, which, <laughs> which is something I was pushing. I was talking with uh, one of the artists last year at Comic-Con. I was like, well, we got to make this happen. So we kept pushing. Yeah. And so it's, it's basically kind of getting a chance to direct sort of a half of a movie because the events that are happening in Sharknado 3 it, this is like a side story because Riverdale is actually on the East Coast and the East Coast is hit in Sharknado 3. Mm. So I'm getting to tell sort of a side story and I keep thinking there's nothing left to do with a Sharknado movie and it's like, oh, what if Betty and Veronica does this? What if Archie does this? <laughs> so it's actually been a really fun I love the Archie experience. comics too. Like that's so awesome that you decided to use the Archie comics. Yeah, they, 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 I'm glad they worked it out because it's, uh, it's, it's going to be it's going to be pretty awesome. And it's, and it's also, the t- you know, tonally it kind of sort of fits. Kids really like our movies. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, for whatever reason, I mean, they're they're violent and people get eaten, but there is this sort of kind of inner 12-year-old kind of sensibility with sharks in a tornado. And, and then what if he gets eaten? And da, 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 da. Yeah. And so I, I think it's a perfect <laughs> marriage versus something like, let's say it was, you know, uh, Sharknado versus Batman or something. I mean, Batman, you know, he's, he's not he's going to survive. But Archie, we can kill people off and they're just every man like Ian Ziering was in the in the first movie. Yeah, I think that's the charm of these movies is it's just this guy trying to solve problems with his family yeah. as opposed to a, a superhero or as opposed to you know uh, any a scientist or military person with guns doing that. It's just, this is just normal people. Just a regular dude. And then they decide to destroy last to destroy the Sharknados with with bombs in the tornadoes. Okay, now that was amazing that you thought of the bombs because how did you even think of that? Is that like that, but scientifically, do you think that, that's really true? No, that was that was that that was in the script under road, and but then was like, well, wait, wait a minute. Okay, so <laughs> is, is this is this possible? So I actually I actually went and, and researched and said, could could a bomb actually neutralize a tornado? And if it was actually a, a, an atomic bomb, so I you know we there there's a, a little a couple. <laughs> it, it's interesting that the Baz character Jason Simmons actually makes a comment about it in the first movie, which is actually me kind of being like a Greek chorus, talking about this. But but I, I think again the charm of these movies is not uh, a explaining the origin of it or overthinking it because the if you do an origin and say oh these sharknado started and you have a scientist it takes away the thing of it i think the beauty of it is they just exist they're like an earthquake they're like whatever and yeah. and the and the great part is that they they do whatever we ask them to do yeah okay they could take down a plane they could do this they could do that and i i think that's why it, it's got this little little charm to it because it could it could be whatever we want it to be. Yeah. And you know I think we're like Freddy Krueger. He's he kills people in the dreams. We never it's never explained why he can do this. It just happens. You know why can't you kill Jason? He he just you can't kill him. And when you start explaining it, it takes some of the magic away. And I've written a lot of movies where the mythology is so headstrong where you it, you have to follow this. The banshee has to do this because it does this. This one it's just it's freedom. It's yeah. like fine, okay, it can chomp through the top of a car. That's and it's not a shark, it's a shark NATO shark. And then you're like, let's have sharks falling into a old folks home where there's all these old people running out of the pool and this is so funny. It's yeah. the most ridiculous and amazing, amazing movie series that I've ever oh, seen. You. Yeah. <laughs> and so now after Shark NATO, do you have plans for the future? Uh, you know, just it's it's. Con- I got to finish this movie first. Yeah. I, I I I keep joking, but again, it's been two and a half years, and even though we've had like one um, you know a month or two off in between, and I've done some commercials and I've written a couple other scripts for people, but uh, it feels like I I've been making Sharknado one for two and a half years. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't feel like it, it's ever ended. Yeah. So you know, I've I've a couple of the projects that are percolating, and uh, you know, the the good thing about what's happened with Sharknado is that I still have the career as the horror guy, but. Um, it's op- Sharknado has opened up the doors because people are talking to me about visual effects things and comedies and, and other stuff that I would have never been considered for. I did a commercial that was VFX heavy that was kind of a fun kind of video game kind of thing and it, it, I would have never gotten that without Sharknado. And I did a, a, a VW campaign that hasn't come out yet that, oh, that cool. has nothing to do with uh, uh, visual effects or horror or science fiction. It was just this funny... Uh, thing and it and it was it was actually great to get a chance to do that and I've always liked comedy and horror but I'm always lean toward the genre mm-hmm. so I think that's that's the the great thing and the gift from Sharknado is that it's you know it's like look if I can do you know Sharknado for you know a couple million dollars imagine if someone gives me you know a hundred million dollars to do a studio film it's like we've proven we can make blockbuster movies on a, on a uh, you know, on a price tag, you know, yeah. and, and I think that's where the industry's going because you can't have people making three hundred million dollar movies. You have to have people making seventy five to one hundred million. So you bring somebody like me in with, you know, that kind of uh, budget and schedule. It's like you're going to get more because that's I awesome. know how to do things 
you know, economically and fast. And still really funny and entertaining. Yeah, and still fun and exciting and crazy. And well, I hope you get one of those studio $75 million I'll take budgets. It. I'll take it. I'll take whatever. As, as, long as, as long as you can connect to the material, it's like, yeah. you know, that that's what it's always about. I mean, there's sometimes, like, I'm not into the torture porn movies and stuff like that. So yeah. you can't really connect to those. But everything else, it's like if you find your way into it, like Sharknado, there, there's a there's a thing, some, you know, you could have come in and just said, okay, it's done, I'm, I'll walk away. But I cared about the concept because I love the concept. And so if you can love it and embrace it and anything that you do, that's that's the key. And that's why that's how you end up with stuff that you can be proud of. Because this stuff's permanent. I think that's the thing people don't realize. Sometimes like, oh, I'm just going to make a movie in my backyard and put it out on YouTube or whatever. But this stuff exists forever. And I always tell actors, what, what, what is this? And they go, it's a, it's a box. I like, no, that's the frame. And whatever you do there, 30 years from now, people are going to come back and going, hey, remember when you did that? And if, if you know, you're not on that day or you're just like, ah, I'm miserable, I don't want to be in the scene today, it, it's going to be there. And you're going to always remember that. And it's like, oh, I, I, should, have, I should have you know, given 150%. Cause, cause totally it, cause, and, and, and for me as a director, it's like, you know, they're going to be unearthing this stuff. So <laughs> I, I, I at least have to be proud of it or own the, 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 what it is. Otherwise, you know, what's the point? Yeah, that's totally a good tip because I think that if you're working on a project that you don't really have your heart into, it's just not going to come out the same. It's not going to it's not going to do as well. You know, everybody wants to make movies. It's like it's a, it's a gift to do these things. It's a gift to be in this industry. I come from a small town in Northern California. And I didn't really have a lot of connections here, and I had to kind of work hard to kind of make a place for myself in the industry. Yeah. And so I'm grateful for this. You know, it's like because this is what I wanted to do since I was 11, and I got the chance. It's so cool. How did you first start like getting into it? Did you start like doing special effects as a beginning thing, or? No, I started writing about journalism. I just started writing reviews because I didn't know what to do in my hometown. So I was like, okay, I'll just write reviews, and I started getting some interviews and started writing for the local paper. And then there was a film class in, uh, at my community college when I was in high school, and I, I, I kind of weaseled my way in there, and that was it. Pretty much I started making shorts. And a lot of the same people, that there's, a, there's about two or three people I met in that class that I'm still friends with today. Um, one of them, uh, uh, M. Stephen Felty and his wife, Kathy, uh, Steve, Steve's been in uh, pretty much all my movies in some form. He was the villains in the first two movies, uh, and then you know he's, he's had little cameos in the other stuff. So. It's, it's kind of interesting. It's like who you start off with is sometimes who's the people you're going to end up working with for a very long time. That's true. I've seen that in so many directors, like even James Cameron. He has like the same actors and stuff that he likes to bring back. And, yeah. You know? I mean, it's the X factor. If you can eliminate some X factors of that unknown on a movie, that's why you bring back DPs or ADs or composers or whatever. You bring back the same people over and over again because then you know you don't have to worry about what's going to happen. Right. And then you can worry about the stuff that is happening with new people that are, are driving you crazy or not doing their job. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so amazing. I love it. Well, I am just wanted to say thank you so thank much you. for coming on the show. Yeah. And, you know, everybody needs to go and see Sharknado 3. <laughs> And uh, thank you to Sci-Fi for putting together the budget for everything and helping to make sure that it gets out there. And the Asylum. They're and the Asylum. Company. Thank you for watching director Anthony C. Ferrante on... The Red Booth. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs>